Hello, everybody, and welcome to Season of Liberty Podcast, Episode 56. So we're going to go with Jeremy for the BIPCOT NoGov license. Yes, as always, the Seeds of Liberty podcast is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows for reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. Is, is Michael Dean going to mail me a BIPCOT sticker for my, uh, I guess, <laughs> ANCAP crowbar here? you, you got to pay for yours, Dave. <laughs> all right never mind I, I don't even think we have stickers i we don't have i, I haven't gotten any stickers but there's buttons i can get you a button mm, <laughs> then i'm gonna have to like duct tape it on there or something that ain't gonna work <laughs> so today we have michael linscog uh who is a leave me aloneist and and we will please ask him to um elaborate on why he hates labels uh <laughs> Because he made his own up, but anyway, uh, he's uh, he's. he's so are you the fa- you're the founder of um, FreeAid.com? No, no. Nope. Are you um, just like you contributor? Uh, right, right now, yeah, we're all we're all just volunteers. I guess I have a title. It is the lead medical and charitable coordinator. Um, okay. Simply because, as a volunteer, when I came into the organization, I took it upon myself to just really push the organization, reach out to event organizers. Mm-hmm. Uh, set up volunteers, just getting down to the nitty gritty. Getting people involved. Yeah, exactly. Helping people out. Um, really, okay. just that's we, that's the way we at Free Aid operate. Um, people who come in, they can exert as much of an effort as they want, essentially. Yeah. All right. So, so just to let people know, that's Free Aid F R three three eight A I D dot com. And you can find them on Facebook. Same thing, free fr338 on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, so they've got what's going on a wig campaign, which I'm going to let him explain that. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the history of uh, of how he came to Liberty, and uh, and then how he came to the freeaid.com and uh, and what he's got going on there. So uh, so Michael, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I read the um, the little blog post that uh, talks about um, you know uh, what's the name Paul Frontier. Um, Paul Frontiero, yeah, Frontiero, right? Yep. And uh, you know, I, so he was he was the um, the reason that that website was started, the whole the whole website, or just uh, a week. No, he he was uh, for for me personally. His passing came at a certain time in my life, where I was in my young twenties, uh, and he was in his late twenties, um, and we worked together in the medical field uh, as EMTs in Boston, Massachusetts. And he sacrificed his life saving two women that lived beneath him in an apartment complex, uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. Someone, it, it's it's all detailed. It's it's kind of it's still so it's it's over four years later, and as an EMT, I had to work with a kind of a cold demeanor just to kind of get things done and to be cool, calm, and collected in crazy situations. And it hasn't been until recently that I really kind of kind of gained emotions back in a way uh, where I'm the kind of eh. you're not dead to the uh, well I guess I, other people yeah I, I was really able to to keep that I guess the mask I was able to wear it well dehumanizing not not dehumanizing because I definitely had compassion for all these patients but I was able to make it like a business thing where I was just there doing my job, and I'm, I tried not to get personal because then when you get personal, it, it that's when it becomes difficult when, you know, bad things happen to people. Sure. If you ha- bad things happen to people that you really care about, it's more difficult than if it's just a John or Jane Doe. Well, sure. it's Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's dehumanizing, Dave. It's more like compartmentalizing. And you yeah. ha- I mean, I, I, I've had friends who, who, have, who, have been e- who are EMTs, too, and... There is a, I, I, for at least from their explanation to me, there is a level of desensitization that you ha- that you kind of have to go through, otherwise you'll go insane. Right. Um, just like what you're explaining, like if you can't shut that off to some extent. Then... I think that's kind of what I meant by dehumanizing. You know, I, I know, like I know. maybe maybe dehumanizing the the situation. No, it's, like, I said, it's... like hey, look, I'm just doing my job here. This is you know a patient, you know. Yeah. So yeah, this this was back in 2011, and around that time, I had just started becoming a, a constitutionalist. I, I did kind of go by a label <laughs> in a way. Uh, yeah. I was, it was Michael Badnarik that turned me on to the Constitution. He had an eight-hour YouTube series that yep. just kind of really flipped a switch that 
just kind of, it changed my whole paradigm. Uh, so I started delving into that. Constitutionalism led to more edgy libertarianism. And then after, after a while, it just logical progressions, anarchism, owning ourselves, self-governing, uh, just the likes. Uh, that, that continued to progress even further to an ANCAP status in a way, and then trying to, now I'm just, I, I've used the term, leave me aloneist. I got that, han I got that from Ernie Hancock, uh, declare your independence, uh, on LRN. Um, I think that just, that, that fits me the best in a way that essentially you do your thing. I'm going to be over here doing my thing and leave me alone. <laughs> My my brother subscribes to the, the kind of the same thing. He he calls it uh, staying in your own lane. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. He's like, you stay in your lane, I'll stay in my lane. We'll all be all right. Most people on a base level really agree with that. Uh, it, it's mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know why that people think once once it becomes a collective thing that rights can be granted to higher higher power to tax and commit war and all types of other horrible things that the state ought to do. It is amazing. Well, it's, it's conditioning. It's years and years and years of conditioning. Yeah. And and what's what's sad is when people when you when you talk like that about individualism and and individual rights and and owning yourself, you know, people um, think that you're you're like, oh, you're so selfish, you're so egotistical, you're just thinking about yourself. What about everyone else? You don't care about other people, you don't care about your friends and your family. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's like what? So I, I, I shouldn't, you know, regard myself highly. Like, I should sacrifice myself for the for the collective. And I mean, I mean, what? There's no way that that you can attend to your own needs for, you know. It's like it's ridiculous logic. You know? Right, right. So yeah, where where I was based geographically and getting into a liberty mindset, I was able to meet up with individuals in New Hampshire uh, that associated with the Free State Project and Free Keen and a few of those liberty groups up there. So I was able, actually able to meet people and talk to other, for the first time, aside from books and podcasts and YouTube videos at the time, being able to talk to other liberty-minded people face-to-face -face really was able, it was hugely influential in my development in my own ideas. It's refreshing when you don't feel alone in an ideology, right? Or or a philosophy or a similar line of thinking. It's like, is no one else looking at like this? Looking at it like this as well? Like I'm the only one? No. Yeah. I I understand what you're saying. It it is it's nice having friends and and people to talk to and and kind of sure up stuff in your head. Definitely, yeah. So it's it's good to know we're not alone out there, and. So once I got into that Liberty community, uh, I had left, I, so the incident with Paul happened in the end of 2011. Uh, I left EMS a month, short, shortly thereafter, a few months thereafter, uh, just cause the burnout rate on people that work EMS is really high. They, they say it's about three years and I, I made it just past that, like four, four and a half years. And I was right. I'm, I'm out. The, the pay is too low. The, the work is crazy. It can be crazy. Sometimes it could just be, pl we're playing glorified taxi dr drivers, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but sometimes we really do use, utilize the skills. Yeah. I, I, I can understand that. I mean, I, I worked, uh, I, I worked at an animal hospital uh, for a few years, um, and I did the overnight. So we were an emergency hospital. So it's the same. It's the same. It's the same premise. Some nights there's nothing going on, and you're just kind of hanging out and you know just watching over things. And then other things happen. And other nights happen. It's, it's insane. And uh, yep. yeah, but I can imagine, like you said, I mean, it, it, to try to desensitize yourself is one thing, but to put up with it, uh, I mean, the burnout rate makes makes sense. I mean, how long can any one person put up with that type of stuff? I, I'd imagine anybody who lasts far beyond that. It has to become really hardened at some at on some level to to continue to put up with that. That's uh, I, I don't know if I can handle that, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, it's working with people is. I mean, it it takes a certain personality type, I guess. <laughs> so you're, so 
Yeah, you were the saying. Yeah, you're I left. Yeah, I left formal EMS, mm -hmm. and I, I still, I still have these skills, and I wanted to help people. And now I'm in this new community in the Liberty Organ, Liberty community, and um, a friend of mine, Pete Ayer, uh, co-founder of CopBlock.org, mm -hmm. tipped me off about free aid. He said, "There's this group of people. They're medically leaning folks. That they they get together at these Liberty events. You should reach out to them." So, I actually I went to FreeAid.com. I went to the contact tab, sent him an email, said, I essentially just said, uh, I'm a former EMT and I'm in the Liberty community now and I'd like to help out. Um, I got a response back from Teresa Warmke, the, the co-founder of Free Aid. Um, and we took it from there. And essentially, I started, the first thing I did with Free Aid was I, re I reached out to folks at Bardo Farm in Croydon, New Hampshire for Bardo Farm Fest. I told them that I would be teaching a, a just a simple first aid class. We had a few people turn out for it and it was pretty good. So yeah, that was the first event that I was at with Free Aid. And since then, I've been at just about every event that we've been to, which has been about two, just about two dozen events now over the course of five years. We've been able to help countless people and we do so i guess our little our radio ad pitch right is free aid is a charitable mutual aid organization that dedicates itself to supporting liberty loving medically skilled individuals free aid teaches health and wellness as well as cpr aed training through their free hearts program we're trying to fulfill this paul frontiero memorial wig campaign now uh it's our latest campaign. It's our second campaign. Our first campaign was in 2013. There was a typhoon that devastated the Philippines. And we were able to raise 14000 the equivalent of $14,000 at the time worth of Bitcoin. Uh, we were able nice. to then mm. get that. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah, we got that over to people in the Philippines on the ground. We got food, water, uh, mm tools, all medical supplies. We, we really made a huge impact in 2013 showing, and it, it's, I think it's, it's the most proud thing that I've been part of free aid with. Cause it, it, it's just a shining star for me because we, we helped a lot of people with Bitcoin and the internet. And it's just back then my understanding of Bitcoin was still slim. So with, this, with the naysayers out there, us being able to do something truly good with the cryptocurrency, people often associated it with, uh, you know, the, the dark net or uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the various various black markets, Silk Road, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, that's just that was our part in showing how you can do good things. It's it's a currency. It's it's neither good nor bad. It's just a tool that we can mm -hmm. utilize. Sure. And we saved. Uh, a good chunk of change by transferring wealth internationally, you know what I mean? Instead mm -hmm. of through Western Union where the fees would have been astronomical. Oh, mm -hmm. well, sure. You're, yeah, if you're able to... I mean, well, that was... I mean, I remember when Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin first started up, that was the problem. It was... You weren't able... You, the idea of it being able to be transported all over the world was there already, but the capa the actual capability of it wasn't because people in other countries had not set it up. But you, this was what you said, this was 2000, was it the typhoon? I forgot. 2013. 13. Yeah. yeah. So by yep. then they, their people were starting to spread. So yeah, once, once you have that capability that people can receive it on the other end, then absolutely you're, uh, <laughs> you're in business. Um, but that's really great. Uh, it was amazing. <laughs> but, but, Digital but, currency mm -hmm. buys stuff and helps people. That's just amazing. Well, yeah, but I, the one thing you said, the, the the thing you said though, is is really I think really important that it's it was the it was it was an example of what can be done, where most people were either hadn't heard of it or were down on it. You know, we we got to do these type of uh, this is what we talk about all the time about you know just spreading the ideas and 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 trying to make the state obsolete. Well, how do you do that? You provide mm. other avenues. You show people how you can do what they especially especially stuff like this what what they assume the government is supposed to do because mm -hmm. look what look what happens every time there is a, a disaster 
Um, you know, there's people are up in arms expecting the government to send half the people are up in arms expe expecting the government to send, you know, demanding the government send money to help them. The other half are, are ticked off saying that that has nothing to do with us. Don't send them the money. Um, but everybody recognizes that it's the government doing it. So mm -hmm. th it's like it's not even another option. Like, yeah, charities here, charity, you know, charities there. But um, th those those charities that people go through that um, are, are supposedly private still have to go through the government regulations. They're five oh, you know, they have to get their they have to get their permission slips and their five oh one CPs, which means there's certain things obviously that they certain regulations they have to follow, um, which means there's certain things they wouldn't be able to do. Like Bitcoin, for example, I'm sure. I'm sure there's there there's no way any any one of those charities could actually try to do anything in Bitcoin without going through the government and asking if it was okay first. And, and here, <laughs> here you guys were able to be on the spot right away. Okay, here's the money we can raise. We can get it there in hmm. you know minutes, whatever. I mean, what the actual the actual um you know the transfer time is nothing, but you know the actual uh, when it's approved can take a little while but still it's it's sh it shot over right away and like you said in, instead of right. doing it, West it wasn't a, yeah it was not a matter it didn't take a matter of weeks for the funds to get there and then that turned into real thing tangible items that people can use uh it was there hmm. minutes Instant, instantaneous <laughs> just about yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. well that's what, I'm saying. Yeah, that, that's, that's what the reality of bitcoin is is like banks either have to adapt to be able to match that to the consumer or cryptocurrencies are going to put the banks out of business just a hyper interconnected world and it's just it's just the times we live in and so it's just a new it's a new tool that comes with the territory of this digital landscape that we're now all a part of sure yeah yeah it's it, it, it's just the next step in, in the evolution of money you know i mean it's uh, i'm always telling my kids you know the difference between currency and money <laughs> because i think it's important to to distinguish that um, because, you know, and tell them, you know, this is just pieces of paper, piece of paper with ink on it. That's it. <laughs> right. It's not, it's not money. It's currency. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I uh, specify with gold and silver, you know, silver coins, that's, that's money, right? Um, that has intrinsic value. It's not determined by any fiat or edict, right? And Bitcoin is essentially the same thing, but digital, right? It's the value is comes from people participating in it and using it, right? And setting up their businesses around it. So yeah, really awesome. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, now, uh, the one thing I, I did want to ask though, because I, 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 you had mentioned this the last time we spoke, but I, I didn't really uh, delve too much into it, because uh, you said you guys accept like donations in any form, right? But you, what, yeah. but you only use Bitcoin, so that means you only like when you pay for things, you, you, you only pay in Bitcoin. Is that how? Is that what you? Is that how that works? Uh, well, or, or there's you certain try, ways. Or you try to. <laughs> yeah, uh, if if a volunteer brings in medical supplies or something we'll we'll reimburse them the price of the equipment or the, the supplies in bitcoin if we're setting up like certain travel arrangements or <laughs> in as many instances as we can we are utilizing it okay mm -hmm. yeah okay so that's yeah but it, we, we don't have we don't have a huge operational cost um our our biggest our store of value is in our volunteers, essentially. It, it's really not in Bitcoin. No, no, I, uh, I, 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 I get that. <laughs> I just, I was just, I was just curious about because you had mentioned that, and I was, I was just trying to figure out how, how exactly that worked. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, obviously, um, you have a dedicated group of people that are that are doing the actually doing the work, and if if they're volunteers, well, they're not getting paid. <laughs> so right, so right. Yeah, there's that. There can't be too much overhead. Um, but that's also got to be extremely convenient you know that's another that's another wonderful thing about this day and age you don't, you don't need to have a storefront for something like this yeah you got you got you guys don't even have to be all in the same area as long as you can get to one another when 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 actual when you're actually going to events and stuff right like you could operate for the most part completely separately of one another uh, i would assume yep we do, we do encourage uh volunteers to go individually if they're comfortable with it to these particular events or you know there's always strength in numbers especially when you're talking about medical coverage of any sort um, but we do have we have almost 100 volunteers across 13 states three countries and two continents wow so hmm. yeah it's it's a lot it's, it's a solid it's a small group but it's a it's a core dedicated group of people that really believe in our mission of helping each other advance a voluntary society 
Sure. Well, yeah, and, and again, this is you know this this is how this is how quote unquote we do it. <laughs> this is how you show people. Okay, you you, you think you think uh, nobody will want to help one another in a free society? Well, no. Here you go. Here's people who don't have to be doing this are living in the current society and trying to show you that no, no, this can be done right now. So if it could be done mm. right now, why couldn't it be done in the future with less hurdles in the way and mm -hmm. more people <laughs> being given the opportunity? Because that's the one thing um, that, you know, there, all those charities out there and stuff, the, the ones, you know, the government approved ones that get the uh, that have to follow the rules. And, you know, there's been enough of them that have been found out to be doing less than uh noble things with the money that they get shall we say over the years you know they're, they're always getting caught up whenever whenever they do those rankings uh when people actually investigate it they show that like how much of the money actually goes to the people i mean it's uh, still not on the government level where like you know what is it every like seven cents that the government takes in actually goes to the poor people they're supposed to be helping um mm. I, I don't think it's that bad uh but th that happens enough but they're I, I, amongst them, amongst those groups, there's still good people that volunteer for them that just want to help. Absolutely. But the, I, I would, I would think that they w might be hesitant to 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 jump ship, or as it were, and, and work for an organization such as yours for the same reason that the people that run these organizations are leery about just jump just getting rid of their 501c3 and saying, well, no, we're just going to do this anyway. Uh, you know, that, that, I, guess, I guess that's got to be another hurdle because you, you really, at the, at the present mm -hmm. moment, I'm guessing you could only really pull from the liberty movement, I guess. I mean, you could, could probably pull from outside too, but it, I guess it would be a harder sell to some people who are so conditioned to think that it has to be government approved or it's not. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just some scam. Right. Well, yeah, a lot of the events are... All the events we do are either Liberty or Bitcoin events. Mm -hmm. As of now, uh, I personally have been trying to reach out to non-Liberty groups to disguise myself, essentially, just to reach out and try and plant seeds. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, that's what it's all about, is planting seeds of Liberty in the minds of people. And then, you know, if they, if they bear fruit, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we can only hope. Yeah. Planting, <laughs> planting seeds of Liberty podcast. You mean, no, <laughs> precisely. So, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we do around so, here. So the way the way I look at that, which is awesome, it's like death by a thousand cuts because you know, like Jeremy said, the way the way that we you know achieve a voluntary society is by making the state obsolete, right? Not by resisting the state or by attacking politicians or by you know, like the way Larkin was said, the problem is not in Washington D.C., right? The problem is in the people's minds and the way they think about authority right. and hallucinating that they have power over other people. And so you are challenging, you know, the the, the you know the government-approved charities and welfare state, let's say, and then like other people, like unschoolers are challenging the government, you know, government schooling. Then you have you know, Dale Brown from the, from the, from the Detroit threat management, challenging the, the police and the law enforcement. And so all right. these different people challenging different areas of, uh, of government monopolies. That's how you do it. That's how you bring, you know, the end of this, this belief in authority of statism, right? You show people that this is the way it's done <laughs> and you're doing it. It's awesome. We'll do it. We'll do it more efficiently. We'll do it with more compassion. We'll do it overall better, and it's just, we're, it, it, it's, it, it really is up to us to create these alternative institutions that people have been conditioned to believe that the state has a monopoly on, mm -hmm. whether it's banking, medical care, media, it's every, every aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, every, everything they can get their grubby paws on. Then they, they really have. The tentacles are on in everything. It's insane. I, I, I saw a headline for an article the today that there was a Bitcoin detective investigation unit within the NSA or something like that. <laughs> so I don't know. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, they, well, they they had to they had to hurry up and learn about it because uh, a couple of their own were stealing it, weren't they? Was it wasn't that what happened? Ended up happening in the uh, the Silk Road trial. The the people that were supposed to be setting up Ross, two of them were actually pilfering the bitcoins and i, I still I, I don't think they. <laughs> yeah, don't yeah think there they, are two fbi agents well I, I think it was i think it was one fbi and somebody else did the dea get involved somewhere? it wasn't it, it wasn't two fbi it was one fbi and another one from another organization but yeah they, <laughs> that was the thing you know at first when bitcoin came out even the banks didn't know what to do uh, until some people started noticing that some of the banks started uh 
dealing in it, or at least the people who own the bank started dealing in it. And then you realize, okay, yeah. well, they know. So now we definitely have to get in on it. And the government has to do. <laughs> It's like Bitcoin's illegal. It's immoral. It's wrong. Wait, how do I set up my Bitcoin wallet? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. It's uh, well, like anything else, it's just about control because we have to deal with that here in New York. You know, we're one of the states that came up with the. You know, everybody's come oh. up with these stupid laws about it and bit license. Yeah, exactly. It's it's insane. Like, I, I went from being able to deal with my little Bitcoin wallet, which I don't have that much in, but whenever I would use it. Uh, with no issues and then all of a sudden one day i go to make a transaction and now i have to fill out all this extra information and i'm like really for for what purpose why why is it really well obviously we, we know why because they they need to track everything i'm doing because they want to know where my money is at all times which that that alone that the fact that that doesn't that orwellian-esque uh, uh, control and and focus on your wealth that 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 doesn't click with mo more people is just beyond me I, I try to give status the break some more times than than Dave will, um, but uh, I don't. I don't. I that one kind of just baffles my mind. Like, how do you not see that? <laughs> they want. They, yeah, they, my, they, my... they need to know where your money is, how much you have. Well, they're like, they're like, what are you talking about, Jeremy? I can go outside. I can go to the store. I can get groceries. I can go to the amusement park. What are you talking about? I'm free. Okay, I can do whatever I want to do. Yeah, the I ants can drive, and the ant are also drive, free, right? I can drive anywhere I want. What's wrong with you, Jeremy? Come on. Stop focusing on the negative, all right? Yeah. Well, if the, if the negative, if, <laughs> Do whatever you want as long as, as, long as it's exactly what I say. <laughs> if, if the negative wasn't affecting me so severely, I, maybe I would leave it alone. Unfortunately, the negative is usually the things that I just want to do that wouldn't be hurting anybody else. But for some reason, I have to either jump through hoops or have to worry about being, uh, have a run-in with one of the uh, with one of New York's finest, and uh, I, I try to avoid that at all costs. Uh, no sarcasm, right? No, no, not, not at all. <laughs> so actually, the the, the 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 title of you know Joel Saladin, uh, the um, the uh, the farmer from uh, like a biodynamic farmer out west. He wrote a book. He wrote a book, and the title of his book is um, "Everything I Want to Do Is Illegal." <laughs> <laughs> I think that encapsulates it pretty well. <laughs> well it's true. He's yeah. a fellow that wants to just he's he's an also he's a leave me aloneist as well. He's just yeah. out there trying to do his farming and right. he just wants to be left alone. Just let the man do what he wants to do. He's yeah. farming. He just wants been, it's doing something that he's been doing for decades. He needs more yeah. money to pay people off, duh. <laughs> yeah, but he just wants the he just wants the he just wants to grow his food. He doesn't and... have enough money to pay off the gang, man. Because raw Amish dairy farmers are more of a threat to society than, you know, <laughs> soldiers and politicians, right? right. <laughs> and, they, and they necessitate an armed federal uh, FBI raid, right? <laughs> Where's your cheese? Where's your milk? <laughs> you know? Guns drawn. It's like We've determined you're a threat to society. Exactly. Guns drawn? That is so yeah. ridiculous. Can you imagine Jeez. that? <laughs> yeah, the dairy farmer's going to just have, like, uh, you know, just a gang of mother frigs in there with... Automatic weapons, just waiting for the feds to come in there and stop them from making food. Is that is that you? Yeah. You really I, think that you really think there's cheese in that refrigerator? Think again, buddy. <laughs> if I was a dairy farmer in this day and age, I'd probably have a line. I'd probably have a a gun, a gun rack set up for 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 the inevitable uh, day that they would show up. But yeah, I get what you're saying, Dave. Normally, they're these people are are not a threat of any kind. So why would they be prepared? But that's. That's just intimidation. That's what they in those situations. That's all it ever is. Because... Well, yeah, but it's like the government's rolling up on a heroin farm or something. I mean, geez, Louise. Uh, <laughs> well, they they have, no, there's well, just dairy farm. <laughs> just just like the just like the IRS has to do that when they when they roll out their big guns because they have their own SWAT team. So when they do their raids, they have to justify. Well, if you that, don't use your budget, you're gonna lose. Well, it. exactly. That's what that's what, that's what I was gonna. That's what I'm <laughs> saying. They they have to justify the the fact that they have these people in place to begin with, and how do you do that other than using them? Because, I mean, the average person probably wouldn't notice, but there's enough people out there, even even in the status world, that that pay very close attention to budget issues and what's being spent where, even on a local level. Um, actually, I would say even even more uh, significantly on a local level, especially around here, there's a couple of you know crazy uh, conservatives that I've known for a long time that are very aware of what goes on with those things. So they <laughs> people would notice, you know. So yeah, you, you have to you have, you have to make use of these things because why you know the the fact that the IRS I mean 
now we're getting a little off topic, but the fact that the IRS has a SWAT team in general is just absolutely insane. <laughs> no, they don't have no, a I think, SWAT I think, team. I think, they I have multiple SWAT oh, no, okay. teams. It's, it's, <laughs> but, okay, but no, the, IRS, the, the IRS, I can understand. The, U, the USPS and the and the Bureau of Land Management have, well, have no. SWAT teams. Well, that's, well, like, actually, that's like, well, what? For, for mail? Are you serious? Well, no, but even if you're, if you're, if you're, even if, if, even if you're trying to Department of think, Education as well. If you're trying to think in this, if you're trying to think in the statist mindset, the BLM actually makes sense out of all of them because that's protecting what they believe to be their property. So that actually kind of makes warped sense. But the IRS, you know, like there was, who was it? They went after the, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't Gibson, was it? No, it was one of the other guitar makers. Uh, they went after a few years back and they, you know, they did multiple raids. Oh, it, it was Gibson. Was it, it, well, was, it was Gibson. Okay, yeah, yeah. They, and, and, they, they stole their mahogany. Yeah, it was right? all over. Yeah, it was a specific type of wood that they yep. supposedly had that had been labeled endangered, I guess, or whatever. Like, <laughs> with the <laughs> after the, fact. The, the Yeah, and it just... And, yeah, and they went after him, and they, and they raided him multiple times. That was actually... I mean, that was a few years back now, but that was actually what started... That was one of the things that I found out early on that I was like, whoa... Okay, something's really not right here because the IRS should not have a SWAT team, um, and they they do stuff like that. And so, the, but these other organizations, I mean, who who sends them after the the dairy farmers? What is it? The FDA? They have their own SWAT too. I mean, come on. I mean, they obviously work with local uh, local it, police. Most of the too. time, it'll be probably a local yeah. ag yeah, ag local... commissioner. Yeah, it'll be it'll be it'll be the bureaucrats, and they'll have the local police, which is even worse because those are the people that, again, the average person thinks, oh, well, they're not like the politicians; they're they're separate. The police, they're there. I mean, they That's have Jim. I know him exactly. They they're not going to think that, but now <laughs> now you got some federal or state or whatever it is bureaucrat coming in and just barking orders, and your buddy that you go drinking with on Friday nights is now pointing a gun at your at your other friends and going, okay, everybody on the floor. It's like, what the heck happened here? But that stuff happens. The fact that it happens at all, the fact that it happened more than one, at once is bad. The fact that it's happened more than that is is uh, unconscionable. Well, what they what that happens is is that like the feds claim, you know, we, there's too much corruption at the local level, so we have to have these federal you know, enforcement wings of our, our agencies and uh, well, that's their justification. Oh, those won't be corrupt, but, you know. And then who's who's watching the watches, right? So they get corrupt and you need a global enforcer, right? Oh, when, that's when what they, a when the global When the global them. enforcers get corrupt, then we need a, a solar enforcer. <laughs> solar <system. laughs> we need to just keep it larger. <laughs> we need the guardians of the galaxy. That's it. They'll take care of everything. That's it. No one will be corrupted. <laughs> There comes a point in, in people, especially like authorities' lives, where someone might come across them and say, hey, your money or your life. And from that point forward, they're dirty. I mean, if we're, if we're, if, if politics already isn't a dirty game enough, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the ones who get in there with a conscience. <laughs> right. Well, the ones, that, the ones that get in there with a conscience usually are not long for the job because they either get very fed up very quickly and leave or they try too hard to change things and then the establishment even on the local level the establishment will get together and make sure that the next election they're out um, or the ones that the ones with the good conscience that stick around almost always end up just being swallowed up by the system and just become another one of the cogs and they lose whatever uh you know, I mean, one of the one of the greatest examples is is the is the a hole who I have now lived under, because no matter I've moved twice, and he's re, he's realigned his district both times so that I'm still in. <laughs> um, Peter Peter King, um, my uh, I, I used to affectionately call him a Congress critter. Now I just call him a piece of shit. Um, but that guy, I mean, he's been in there since the mid '80s, I want to say, and I know. The local conservative groups, I know the, the heads of these groups because as on my way to anarchism, I stopped in the Tea Party briefly and then headed to libertarianism. So I got to meet some of these people and I became friendly with them and I stayed friends with them. But I heard some stories from them because they were the, they were the type of people I were talking about earlier that, that, that are constantly watching. They still think there's some magic way we can get back to the, get back to the Constitution and everything will be fine. But they keep a very close eye on what goes on. In like they know everything, um, all the budget stuff, everything. Uh, but they worked 
with Peter King, and they helped him get elected the first time around. And they have told me stories about this ideologue who was so fed up with the corruption that he saw, and he was going there to make a difference. And for the first four or five years or so, he was real, you know, he stuck to his guns and he kept most of his campaign promises or at least whatever he could. And when he didn't, he came back home and explained it to everybody what went wrong and why he tried and he got outvoted and he tried to like, he even went so far as trying to explain how the system worked to these people, like tried to like really, really trying. And then slowly but surely, he just started drifting and drifting and drifting. Uh, and then, it, you know, then he got handed the keys to the uh, to Homeland Security for a while. And he had uh, my friend actually has lived next door to him for I think well, I think her entire life, uh, or not next door, like two two or three houses down, but on the, you know on the same block and in, in very in very close proximity. And she would tell me stories. She would send me pictures of him with the security detail, like Secret Service, like president level secret service type people with the, with the deck we you know with the decked out uh uh suvs and all that stuff just hanging around his house at all times a day like the <laughs> amount of money that was just that was getting stolen and then pretty much given directly to peter king was insane <laughs> but that's what happens and it happens over and over and over again cuz most of those guys most of the you know most of the politicians like you see that people even even the status will complain about like the the 20 30 year guys that have been there forever most of them started out with good intentions and look what <laughs> happened but, but Jeremy, you got you got to think outside the box, you know, like Bernie Sanders or like Donald Trump, you know. Just, Bernie just Sanders, think outside, think Bernie think outside the box. Bernie Sanders, who's been a politician <laughs> since the early seventies, <laughs> career politicians. That's and, and was, and was, yeah. The guy, Bernie's ridiculous. The guy had the guy. Oh God, I had an argument with somebody recently who <laughs> convinced me that Bernie had worked in the private sector significantly. I'm like, he became. <laughs> Bur the, the the mayor of Burlington, Vermont, in what the early seventies, I think that was his first gig, oh, and he pretty damn. much just like I think he took a couple year break after that, trying to get other positions and, and uh, other seats and couldn't, but he was still working like with the different political groups, and that's pretty much all he was doing, and he did side jobs to make a little money. So they talk about him <laughs> being a teacher, and this one woman tried to tell me, well, he was a teacher. I'm like, he worked for Head Start. It's a government program. The guy has literally been a government employee almost his entire <laughs> life. He has had his entire <laughs> life subsidized by, and plus your by, job. By, by either the taxpayers or directly through handouts and kickbacks or whatever. And I don't care how great they say Bernie is and how he doesn't take the stuff. They all do. Anybody who stays there <laughs> that long, they have to. It's impossible not to, with the exception of maybe Ron Paul, but that's also that's also evident in what happened to him. You know, he would nobody would ever vote on any of his bills. <laughs> everybody was just saying he, he was, was like, a no, career Ron. politician too, though, right? He, yeah, which is why I mean, he I did have his OBG practice. But no, aside from that, exactly. he's a career politician. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to the great man theory of Ron Paul that that a lot of people in the in the liberty movement do. Um, I actually I did in 2008. I didn't. I didn't find out about him until after, because I came late to the game. I didn't start coming yeah. to this fully until after the 2012 election. So I still, you know, I had barely heard about him. Um, but yeah, yeah, but still, he was. He was a politician. He he took he took he took the money. Um, but I like I said, I don't think he played. I think it. I think it's evident that he really didn't play the game because nobody helped him out with anything. And that's how it works over there. If you want to get your bill passed, you have to help out on this bill over here. And when you don't. You can see that and what happens when your bills come up. No, it's one big cesspool. That. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, like uh, I think it was Robert Higgs. He said, uh, you know, most status, you know, it's a it's a pool of feces, and most status just try, try to find the cleanest area of the pool with the least amount of feces. And anarchists just want to leave the pool. We want to get out of the pool. <laughs> precisely. <laughs> yeah, we're looking, we're looking at it as crazy because instead of trying, we're to just move, sick of the sick of the shit, you know. Just, it's, 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 instead of trying to find the clean spot, I'm, we're just like, I'm hey, up hey. to here with your shit. <laughs> you idiots, you idiots are looking for the clear spot. I'm like, hey, dude, there's a ladder over here. You see that? <laughs> I'm going that way. You crazy utopian? No, so so it's funny is when I'm, I'm talking to <laughs> I'm talking to status and and you know and you you can criticize Obama, you can criticize Bush, you know, you know Obama didn't close Guantanamo Bay. All right, he, he, yeah, he's pretty bad. Obama, you know, increased the drone strikes. All right, it's pretty bad. You know, Obama, 
You know, did you know George Bush did the bailouts? All right, it's pretty bad. So maybe we shouldn't have presidents. Now you're an extremist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we just need the right person. Well, the, none, the of those, of power, none of those. You know, Obama and Bush didn't do anything. They're just the puppets, man. Right. That's they're it. the they're they're the people that we're supposed to buy and sell as our leader. If yeah. you're one step ahead of society, you're a genius. But if you're anything more than that, you're insane. You're on the fringe. <laughs> you're an extremist. Wow, well, I'm I'm definitely. And exactly, owning yourself is a few steps beyond what most people have been conditioned to think, which is a shame. I guess I could segue back into yeah. uh, creating the things we want to see in a society that would be more free. Uh, mm -hmm. Then this, with this wig campaign, this might be the first Bitcoin fundraising Bitcoin uh, campaign for a wig type of thing. I mean, it's all types of. Everyone's got their the first Bitcoin X, Y, and Z thing, but I don't know. This might be the first Bitcoin fundraised wig campaign. Most likely, yeah. <laughs> um, I've never heard of anything such. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I mean, to summarize, I I appreciate you guys having us on the show and. This is a, a, an important thing to me, and I'm in, we're trying to fulfill this campaign. So anyone that is listening uh, to the podcast online, um, we're, we're looking for a recipient, and we're going to fundraise the wig cost. I will cut off my hair. Um, I've been in touch with the wig maker already. Uh, I'm going to have to get in touch with them again because it was when we initially launched the campaign nine months ago. But the wig maker talks to the recipient, and they, they figure out, the specific type of wig that the individual wants and we're going to deliver the wig and hopefully talk to this person. If they happen to be Liberty leaning, we can talk about, we can talk about whatever. I, I just, it's, it's a way for me to memorialize a friend of mine who just been, a, was just super inspirational, who essentially was a martyr in my life mm -hmm. to, to do good uh, and just do good till the end. That's awesome, man. I'm glad. I'm glad you're on a on on a journey for uh, for peace and 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 doing good things, man. Yeah. Now, um, uh, maybe maybe we should uh, explain the whole the whole wig thing a little bit, um, because you 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 I we I talked to you previously and you said that it was uh you were having difficulty finding a donor because there's people there's you there's normally there's channels that people normally go through for this type of thing, correct? Right. Um, mm -hmm. And and people uh. Going back to that conversation we, we just had about the regulations and people being scared off by that, uh, that's that that's been one of your issues, correct? That you have you ha you have you you've been having you've been having problems co contacting a, do a donor, which to me, like I said last night, seems completely crazy because you got to imagine there's people out there that can't afford stuff and are like, hey, somebody wants to give me one, okay? Right. So yeah, nine months ago we launched a campaign. Uh, we were actually at Porkfest when we launched it. Uh, Porkfest is a freedom festival that takes place in New Hampshire every year with the Free State Project. Uh, and I, I recommend that to people. Um, we, Free Aid, do the first aid for that event. We have been doing it. This will be our fifth year in a row now. It's a great spot that if you out there listening haven't been able to, if you are having, if you have similar ideas and you're just listening to podcasts all the time, it's a great place to go meet up for the first time with like-minded individuals and just really explore your own thoughts and concepts but with this wig campaign <laughs> we at free aid are looking for a single individual who finds himself in a medical hardship who could use a wig uh, uh we haven't had we, we've come across some individuals who could have used it but they weren't necessarily looking for a wig at the time does anyone need a beard wig <laughs> I don't know if they do that, and, no. but yeah, no, so it's just, it, we're doing this. It's like a one-off thing. Um, we're not trying to become like a wig organization to do it all, all the time. Uh, after doing this one, it's, it's been enough of a project. You got to just trying to get this one done. You, you got to regenerate the, the source, you know, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> give, give it time. <laughs> Precisely. So how, how many of you are actually growing your hair out to do this? Oh, it's it's just me. Just oh, you are the wig campaign. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, yeah, oh, he, yeah. He's, I'm sorry. He's he, a couple of people doing he's this. He's the he, no, no, no. He's he's yeah. Ready? He's the Here we donor. go. Bam. Just yeah. <laughs> just the long, oh, long, just long you, ponytail. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is a this is a one man ca wig campaign. It's, so so right. so so yeah. So you're trying to find a donor, and 
instead of me going through one of these uh, mainstream organizations, sometimes they charge their patients for their wigs. So I thought we could use free aid as a vehicle to try and find a recipient, fundraise, and then just do everything uh, without the permission of the state, without the permission of these mainstream institutions, trying to do it, bolster free aid's resume, and just, you know, helping people help people. Sure. So, yes, if you out there on the inner tubes know an individual in need, and <laughs> I guess this will be aired Monday. early 2016. <laughs> Since it's been so long of a campaign, I'm saying <laughs> generalizing in seasons. Um, but, yeah, it'd be great if you could reach out to us at freeaid.com. Uh, we have a contact us tab. Just drop us a line. We'll be back in touch. Um, and for us to complete this campaign would bring us some warm fuzzies. <laughs> that's our, that's what we get paid in. So how many possibilities do you have? Do you have any, any possible donors or, or, or recipients? So, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so it, it's been nine months now and I, I personally have been in touch. I've, I've been asking everyone, whether it's uh -huh. people on the street, because I, I feel like with this type of campaign, it doesn't necessarily have to be in like the Liberty community. So mm -hmm. I've gone to, to church events and asked people there, uh, and I get a lot of support. Everyone's very willing to help. People share it on social media. They they share the articles that are written up. Um, but yeah, it just hasn't come to pass yet that we haven't found anyone. So mm. I'm thinking, you know, further further reach through media outlets. And you guys are generous enough to have us on and you know share share our message. Uh, hopefully, this mm -hmm. will be the catalyst to uh, get someone get your haircut. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> precisely. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I just want to say, I, I mean, the whole reason I, I wanted to have you on is because I exactly, I mean, I was hoping that we could get this out to more people because you, the one thing you, you just said quickly there, that was, that was another thing that really bugged me when I heard about this whole story was the fact that I, I wasn't aware that in most of the, in a lot of these situations, people have to pay for these wigs that are donate, that, 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 that these org these other organizations take donations and then they take the hair donations Right. And then they still charge the people for the wig. Like, mm. that's to me, that just seems insane. Like, if somebody is going to you for a wig, is that, because is, the, is that, is that like a legality or a regulation? Uh, I'm not 100% on why. Probably they do just it. so somebody can make some money. <laughs> more, right. more, more likely than not. But that, that's, another mm. reason I, that's another reason I like your organization because you guys are trying to do without that. And, you know, like you said, it, 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 you're the only one doing it right now, and, and that's not the goal necessarily for free aid this is kind of just a, a a project you're doing along the way just another fundraiser type thing and just trying to help one individual but i i actually think this could be a prototype you know hopefully it will inspire other people not i mean hopefully we obviously we can help you or at least some someone along the line can help you find a donor a, a recipient that is uh that that's a good fit you know all around and everybody will be happy um but i i also hope, kind of hope that other people are inspired to pick up this mantle as it were you know if that's not a direction you guys want to go in as a focus which i can understand because your focus is more on the medical side where you're trying to help people in that capacity which is great because that's another thing that doesn't you know normally if you go to events and stuff there's if there's people there they're being paid to be there and if it's you know certain situations it's usually county employees so they're getting extorted money to hang out there and be at festivals and stuff like that um but in other situations, people are getting paid, and because of regulations, the prices are higher than they should be. But I, I, I kind of hope that other people are would be inspired to maybe hear the fact that oh, these these poor people have to pay for these wigs, and here's a model that's already, again, assuming proven to work <laughs> on a small scale. Well, wow, maybe we can do this and get more people involved, and more people who would donate their hair to say. Uh, what is it, Locks of Love or any of these other places? They're not saying that they're the bad ones because I don't know. Um, but just that there's a bunch of them. But instead right. of going to those ones, maybe they'll try starting their own and more people will do that. And that's just another way. So I, I, that's why I love stories like this on so many levels because aside from the good you're trying to do with this sp specific project and the good you're trying to do with the, the organization as a whole, Doing little things like this along the way can also just be stepping stones for other people, which just gets the message out there faster. More people can take it and run with it. And 
more just more people showing the showing others that the state is not necessary, which is just a beautiful, beautiful thing for me. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely I've definitely taken inspiration from a lot of these folks that whether it's from the medical community or the liberty community, but I don't know, they they've driven me to be a better person and to try and create these alternatives that are not funded through coercive means. Uh, and if, if I can help motivate people to do other things along those lines, then even even better. That'd be great. All right. So I, I know we're going to wrap up soon, but the, the one question I did want to ask you is you had, you know, you had mentioned that you go to these different festivals and so far it's been mainly Liberty ones and stuff like that. And that you've also tried to contact other organizations to see if, to ask if they want your assistance. But can people contact you guys and ask them ask you to come to their events on their own, or do you have or do you seek them out only? Absolutely, no. Uh, it's a two way road. People definitely reach out to us through uh, through the website. We have an events page, um, as well as a contact us tab. Uh, that's the best way uh, for people to get directly in touch with us. That 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 would just be an email that shoots over to my inbox through the website at freeaid.com. If people are interested in having us at their event. I encourage people to go to the website, read the articles. We have a lot of health and wellness articles, some basic summaries of our what of our goings on at events uh, as well <laughs> as well as a few other things. So uh, I think we're about uh, ready to close out. So uh, Danilo, you want to uh, wrap us up, or? Yeah, yeah. I just say w one thing uh, that I this kind of reminds me, like when I was practicing acupuncture in a, in a car accident clinic, and I would have some patients that would, you know, obviously have a, a either you know a weave or a wig or you know kind of related. And, uh, and you know, I, I think I think sometimes it's like taboo to ask women, you know, do you, is that a wig? <laughs> But I, I'm just crazy. I just I, I don't I just ask questions, you know. And most people don't get offended with my questions. So I'm like I'm like, is that is that real hair or is that a fake hair? <laughs> and they tell me they're pretty honest. Like, no, this is not fake. I only get real humid hair, which is pretty cool. And I'm like, wow. So we're usually from India. Yeah, usually from India. Um. So and I I saw that document. I don't know if you saw a documentary, Chris Rock. Um. I think it's called Good Hair. Did you see that? I've not about, seen that. No. About the whole wig industry, no. okay, and, and and you know wig and weave industry about and mm -hmm. about how how massive it is and and how um and, and one thing he was saying in the documentary was kind of funny was that he he was kind of trying to illustrate that that um black people cannot sell their hair like nobody wants black people's <laughs> hair they only want white people's hair or Indian people's hair and he and there was even one part in the in the in the documentary where he was like. <laughs> he was on the street. He's like, I got black people's hair, nappy hair. Anybody want nappy hair? <laughs> Nobody came. And, and then he went inside to the place where they were selling wigs. And the Indian guy was like, No, we don't sell those kind of hair. Look at the look at the magazine. Only nice people. <laughs> Are you serious? You don't sell black people's hair? So, <laughs> sorry about that. It kind of reminds That's me. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good documentary. It's pretty funny. Um, but um, but Michael, yeah, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Sharing your story, um, really appreciate it. It's really cool. Never heard of this before. Jeremy, uh, let me know. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to tell people that there is now a private uh, wig campaign, completely uh, <laughs> privately funded, Bitcoin funded. <laughs> the first one of its kind. <laughs> but I guess for like cancer patients or something, and maybe somebody who needs a wig like that. Have you tried a children's hospital or anything like that? So yeah, in in the Boston area, there are a lot of large hospitals uh, and I did reach out to them. The reason they told me that they couldn't help us out was because of a health insurance privacy act which is another government mandate Damn, which does that? which does have some good purposes because uh, an individuals you know because I mean I don't think you fellows are opposed to privacy and especially with your medical records you, you definitely want to keep that you only want you and people you trust to see that information. It, it could be done through alternative means Sure. As far as privacy of medical records goes, and they, I suppose, they could have helped us out if they wanted to. But I'm trying to imagine like a, a little ten year old kid with your hair. Though, <laughs> I mean, would you would you chop it up into two for for two kids' hair? Right? If it could be two I wigs, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. See. <laughs> but you definitely. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it.
thanks for having me guys yeah yeah thanks a lot for uh yeah awesome conversation and please uh if you, when you do finally cut it off you know record and make a youtube video you know that's a that's a momentous occasion so uh <laughs> yeah that, that, that's well that's that's got to be content for the site right there but definitely right there yeah i mean i i i hope i hope i hope you guys obviously uh are, are finally able to find a recipient but uh again i i hope more people are just uh check out your organization as a whole because i think what you guys are doing overall is great and uh i definitely if i finally get my butt out of new york um and uh i i get a little further north i'll make you use your services because <laughs> awesome. we're, gonna, we're gonna do a seize liberty festival one of these days uh i don't know when i don't know where but we're gonna do it there you go so, fr33aid.com yes. events tab contact us we'll link up have a good time excellent nice <clears throat> Awesome. So if anybody wants to um, help help our, our show out, uh, you can do so through Bitcoin or Patreon, patreon.com slash Seas of Liberty to help us out. A dollar a show is good enough for us. Uh, if you enjoy our content, please donate. We, um, we, we get very encouraged by monetary compensation. And, uh, you know, if you find value in what you see, please donate uh, value for value. That's uh, the true anarcho-capitalist way, right? True, true democracy, voting with your dollar. So, or you can just like, comment, share videos and subscribe to the show uh, to help spread the message of uh, volunteerism, liberty, and wigs for this episode. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome uh, conversation, gentlemen. Thank you very much. So this is the Seeds of Liberty podcast. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Peace. Peace.